This morning's a little different. We're going to end after the lecture without questions so that Professor Williams can attend a faculty prayer meeting. If you have questions, burning questions from today's lecture, pre please bring them to this afternoon session, which starts at 4 in this room. Uh, I've appreciated getting to know Stephen even better over these past few days. We were able to worship together yesterday in my home church, and I was pleased that when the pastor said, in expecting a negative response, uh, has anyone gone their whole life without taking the Lord's name in vain, trying to get over the point that we all violate the law, a hand next to me, raised inexorably, a lone flagpole in a sea of sinning Presbyterians. <clears throat> I was proud to be sitting next to that hand, and I'm proud to introduce Professor Stephen Williams to you this morning. Let me uh, su supplement <laughs> that account. Uh, yes, the pastor said, uh, remember you're in church now, he said, hands up anyone who's not taken the Lord's name in vain. Well, that's something I haven't done as far as I know. And yet, as I told Kevin, I felt a hypocrite putting my hand up. I felt I had to do that because I don't believe I have in terms of using God's name blasphemously, which is what he had in mind. But I could easily have stood on my feet and said, but I have done far worse than that. So I felt a hypocrite putting my hand up, and yet what could I do? And uh, Kevin, with typical self-effacement, didn't tell you that he also, to my right, put his hand up. <laughs> Though, as he said to me, not in a Sikh Heil fashion, as I seem to do. <laughs> I was back in school. Uh, well, you, know, you never know what's going to be said in introductions. Uh, but uh, I've also appreciated very much getting to know Kevin these last few days, and uh, thanks for your hospitality, you and your family, uh, on Sunday. Now, it actually works out quite well that uh, the question time for this session is combined with the one this afternoon. Because if I had to place any two sessions uh, on any one day, this, is not, this was not my planning, but if I had to place any two sessions any one day, today is the day I do it, because there are questions arising from this which are naturally answered, I think, in relation to the second talk. It is, of course, uh, a way of trying to make sure that those of you who have burning questions will return this afternoon. It's the, it's the cunning of the serpent along with the innocence of the dove. Well, we're moving on to the New Testament today. C.H. Dodd somewhere alludes to the two-beat rhythm in the history of Israel, judgment and grace. As the Old Testament closes, we do not know how the design of election will work itself out. But we are bidden to be hopeful, for God has salvation in mind, and what God has in mind will surely come to pass. Salvation is not going to happen without judgment. Isaiah, again, is our teacher, though not our only teacher, to the effect that salvation will only come through judgment. Yet the day of the Lord will certainly bring and vindicate his righteousness. There is a saving and judging righteousness. We must all wait to see how God will accomplish and connect them, and believers must wait in tranquil hope. We do know that election's design is a saving design, and we rejoice. Meanwhile, the exaltation of Israel is the object of praise, thanksgiving, and joy among some who are not of Israel, but who know something without understanding much about the activity of God in and through Israel, who glimpse the hem of his garment, the outskirts of his ways, but who know not from within what it is to be one of his people. They will surely be beneficiaries of election, even if it is possible that their gain and privilege will remain subordinated to that of Israel. As we quit the narrative pages of the Old Testament, hope is in place because the temple is in place, but fulfillment is not yet. That's simply a recapitulation of where we got to at the end of the last session. 
Of the four evangelists who pick up their pens to continue the narrative of Israel's history, Luke has a distinction of extending his account to embrace the story of the early church. And this is rather remarkable. Possibly he's the only Gentile author in the New Testament. So now we find Gentiles no longer just building temples, but composing scriptures. And doing so with conspicuous attention to the language of the Old Testament, albeit in its Septuagintal form. But if we follow the canonical order, we are introduced from the very beginning of Matthew to the interest that the nations have in the Savior who comes out of Israel. When the Magi explain to a troubled Herod what they are doing in his part of the world, they quote a scripture pertaining to a king of the Jews, a scripture specifying that out of Judah will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Have you noticed how strange that juxtaposition of things is? Perhaps the Magi will turn out to be a type of those new kings who will displace the old, whether in person or in style, according to the book of Revelation. But this is what is strange. Here in Matthew, the East rejoices in the internal salvation and divine governance of another people, Israel, God's elect. However, the arrival of the Magi in the land is no harbinger of the imminent flocking of the nations to Jerusalem and to Mount Zion. Although Calvary, Pentecost, and what happened between make God's land the scene of unsurpassable saving action for the nations. While the temple, or at least its gate, becomes the site of the first recorded post-Pentecostal healing, the river that will heal the nations does not merely flow out of it to fructify local land for the benefit of nations gathered on a redeeming pilgrimage. It is by mission that the nations become beneficiaries of election. As disciples are promoted to the apostolate prior to the death of Jesus, so the nations are promoted to discipleship after his resurrection. Yet Acts displays a consternating pattern of repetition when compared to the Gospels. The Acts of the exalted Jesus, which Luke now records, follows the pattern of the Acts of the earthly Jesus, earlier recorded. If I had been asked to write the New Testament, but unfortunately no one asked me, I'd have called the Gospels the Acts of the Earthly Jesus and Acts the Acts of the Exalted Jesus. Anyway, Acts follows the pattern earlier recorded. As healing in Acts is followed by proclamation of forgiveness, and both are followed by persecution, we recognize much the same configuration of events witnessed amongst the people up to just a few weeks before in the earthly ministry of Jesus himself. There is unexpected glory in the fact that Jewish hostility can provide the occasion, even the means, for the gospel to reach the Gentiles, as Luke records. However, it is this very repetition of the pattern of Jewish rejection as portrayed in the gospels that causes a shadow to be cast over election, even as the nations are incorporated into God's saving plan. If we expected to take our leave of the history of Israel at the end of Acts with a heart lightened by the fulfillment of the promises in whose sound we take our leave of the Old Testament, we are disappointed. Words ominously uttered in Isaiah and ominously recalled by Jesus in the Gospels are now ominously repeated at the end of Acts. Go to this people and say, you will ever be hearing but never understanding, you will ever be seeing, but never perceiving. Therefore, Paul adds, in a conjunction that will only half gladden the heart, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. The story of election is the story of switchbacks, reversal, and paradox mark its form. The resurrection of the Messiah of Israel far from uniting Jews and Gentiles in joyous fulfillment of hope, appears to move Gentiles into the place of divine favor formerly occupied by the Jews after Jewish-Gentile complicity at the cross. We had been warned by Jesus, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you. 
Can it be that history will prove, after all, the finality not of salvation for the Jews, but of the chilling words of Moses in his farewell speech? I wonder if you know this text. Deuteronomy 28, 68. The Lord will send you back in ships to Egypt on a journey I said you should never make again. Agonizing over the course of history, Paul nonetheless tells his Roman readers that he does not want them to be ignorant of a mysterion. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. The gifts and call of God are irrevocable. What he teaches about the future of Israel is variously interpreted, including the referent of his word, Israel. But on any reading, we must at least remain prepared for more paradox and reversal, not least because Paul warns elect Gentile Christians that they can be cut off too. Election is a continua electio, continuing election, which has a fluctuating history. How many years, decades, or centuries of church history will pass before it becomes clear that these words portend a frightening prospect? That's Paul's words in Romans 11. That the story of the election of the church of Jews and Gentiles might not just veer towards repeating the Old Testament story of the election of Israel, but mutatis mutandis, repeat it. That a history of Jewish failure, picking up uh, Bultmann's word we used earlier uh, in the last session, will mutate into, quote, a medley of error and violence, as church history has been described, the church being more Gentile than Jewish cum Gentile. We are glad that Isaiah has inculcated in us peace, faith, and trust on account of the sovereignty of God over history. The New Testament can sometimes read like one sustained commentary on Isaiah. Certainly, the incidence of Paul's use of Isaiah in Romans, especially Romans 9 to 11, is very striking. In pursuit of his account, Luke injects into it a sentence whose theological life, I think we may fairly confidently say, will never die. When the Gentiles heard what Paul had to say in Pisidian Antioch, and here I quote, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed to eternal life believed. Acts 13.48. It is hard to find a starker statement of predestination in the New Testament, certainly in its narrative portions, although it is perhaps equaled in John. The verb Luke uses is tetagminoi. However we choose to translate the verb, it connotes distinction in this context, marking out these believers from non-believers. It has been parsed in the middle voice, as many had set themselves for eternal life, became believers. Sorry, as many as had set themselves for eternal life became believers. Now, that is an unlikely middle, surely, not least because of the way Luke characteristically writes of God's action in these matters. But whatever we make of it as an independent exegetical suggestion, when we join Paul to Luke in a textual company that reflects the physical company that they kept, we appear to emerge with a notion of God's sovereign activity in the ordination of human history, into which human response is taken up, but not in the form of insertion into God's plan by its own autonomous impulse. And it is this component of the doctrine of election which has caused most controversy throughout church history and has been characteristically treated as its defining factor. The perfect moment to take my jacket off in light of the warmth. Readiness for action is connoted here. <laughs> Not really. I mean, actually, I think that one of the sad things about this whole uh, subject area is the way in which it has uh, divided people as much as it has. The terms predestination and election in theological English overlap to a greater or lesser extent according to different habits of use. 
Predestination often has a wider range than election in two respects. Firstly, it may include events as well as people, whereas election refers only to people. Secondly, where it does refer to people, that is, where predestination refers to people, it is sometimes referred to those destined for perdition as well as to life, whereas we speak of election in a uniformly positive sense as election to life. Conventional theological English has to be mapped on to biblical terminology in order to make theological discussion useful. The nature of systematic theology as a discipline, or perhaps just as execution and practice, renders it liable to the temptation to flatten out biblical vocabulary, elide differences, and overlook context in which an author wrote. While allowing that the words we translate choose or elect, or call, can contain individual distinctions of meaning, as well as being combined in different ways in the New Testament. The problem that Luke seems to introduce us to when we take his witness in tandem with the rest of the New Testament is this. The election or calling of some individuals in historical time has its ground in a prior election or predestination and decision to call. And this seems to many to modify most somberly the note of joy struck in the narrative history of election that joins new to Old Testaments. To transpose a song of joyful hope, Old Testament, into a minor key, New Testament. What has happened to that, and I quote, vast explosion of love, joy, and hope released into the world by the resurrection of the crucified and rejected Jesus, end quote, to use a phrase that Newbegin often repeated. In telling his story, Luke, along with fellow authors in the New Testament, clearly means us to rejoice in predestination. But the Old Testament has encouraged us to suppose that those who are not elect may rejoice in election even while they are yet observers and not yet partakers. That's ground we covered on Thursday, wasn't it? How so? In fulfillment of God's promises, if incorporation in the body of the elect is determined by a discriminate predestination, and when we've learned from Matthew onwards how high the stakes are with personal judgment awaiting at the eschatological end of the road, the barrier between Jew and Gentile is torn down, it seems, only to be replaced by a barrier between those who are and those who are not predestined. Perhaps we should have had more than a mild whiff of this possibility in reading the Old Testament. Perhaps we've glossed over all the signs that this is how God always acts amongst humans. Perhaps there are texts, including texts of wisdom, that should have warned us to operate hitherto when, thinking of the, when treating the Old Testament with a more effective peripheral vision than I did on Thursday. Even if we couldn't see everything at once. We should, when training our eyes on the eschatological hope for the nations, perhaps look out for these things, these things which seem then in the New Testament to become a sign of a discrimination, which seems not to fulfill the hopes of the nations. Does the application of divine predestination to post-mortem destiny really constitute a fulfillment of Old Testament hopes? So we might state the problem. There are two things that we must say immediately, I think. The first is that it is undoubtedly the case that election for service is important in the New Testament. And sometimes the question of post-mortem destiny does not have to be to the fore or even in mind when the vocabulary of election is used. Judas, of course, is often cited in that connection. Of course, the vocabulary of election or determination, all those words can be used uh, for different things. God can determine times and places for the nations. The same word that can be used in relation to predestination. God can choose a course of action, Acts 15. So the words can be used uh, very, very uh, broadly. So we're not saying, in other words, that every time the word predestination or election comes up, it means eternal life. Not saying that at all. The second point I want to make is that in any comprehensive account, we should need to look carefully at the addressees of letters or of speeches. 
the extent to which statements about election or predestination are particularly strong when the incorporation of Gentiles into the people of God is at issue. And correspondingly, we'd have to ask whether warnings about forfeiting the blessing of election are particularly strong when Jewish believers are in mind. I'm not saying that is the case, but we have to look out for that kind of thing. There's a, an interesting area there. But however we tease out these most important details in our investigation, it remains that there is an election that involves eternal life and that Jew and Gentile are joined together as recipients of promise and of warning. We need travel further, no further than Romans, to establish this. Whose de proorisen tutus ekalesen, those he predestined, he also called. And that from among the Jews and the Gentiles. This extends both ways, backwards, whose proegno proorisen, those whom he foreknew, he predestined. And forwards, into the heart of historical time. Catech logen charitos, according to the election of grace, through to the eschatological hope of glory. Where eternal life for Jew and Gentile is involved, along with, not instead of service. The election of grace has been interpreted in at least two ways which seem to me to be implausible. Now, I'm certainly going to be brief and tentative here. Tentative, uh, not because I couldn't defend it uh, if we were, spoke more length, but because really I don't have time to, to, to cover all the very, very familiar argument that goes on around this. So I'm not trying to be dogmatic at all on this. I'm simply indicating where I stand. Two ways which strike me as impossible, uh, implausible sorry, uh, for interpreting predestination language when it applies to eternal life as well as service. The first is often associated with Arminianism, but it has a much older pedigree in Greek and Russian-speaking Christianity, extending back through the 5th century semi-Pelagians or Provençal, even beyond uh, origin to the shepherd of Hermas. Now, to the, say this, by the way, is not to identify Arminianism more widely with semi-Pelagianism. I'm simply taking one point here. On this interpretation, God predestines to life those whom he foreknews, for, foreknew uh, will believe. So foreknown or foreseen faith is the ground of the predestination of the individuals concerned. I'm not pretending to deal conclusively with this interpretation. Allow me to indicate why I, feel, why I find this prima facie implausible. If all else fails and some synthesis of biblical materials is theologically mandatory, whatever Simeon said about that, and don't worry, he's coming back. He'll be back in force this afternoon then we should revisit it. But provisionally, it seems to me to have at least two strikes against it. First, it makes of predestination a ratifying and reactive decree. Reactive not in the order of time, but in the determination of content. It is the response of God to individuals in later time. Ah, this is very familiar, I know. However, predestination statements show no signs of having this form and appear to bear contrary content on their surface. They appear, prima facie, to indicate action that is not only temporarily prior to human action, if we may enclose talk of God within our talk of time for a moment, its content and quality steered by human disposition. Rather, in a creative sense, predestination statements intentionally and sola gratia seem to bring about the historical situation to which they pertain. Secondly, on the Arminian view, the person who is the object of divine foreknowledge is an idealized abstraction from his or her concrete historical form. God would seem to view this person in the first instance in terms of personal disposition, without soteriologically relevant divine activity shaping or contributing distinctively to the shaping of that person's life. Even if God foresees such a person as an agent operating within the sphere of a universally provenient grace that he himself affords, it is not, as he foresees it, a grace particularly effective upon anyone's will. 
So the human person is here conceived of as a being who possesses a general disposition or inclination towards good or evil freely exercised. This person has been conceived in an idealized mode. It is not the actual person that ever turns up in history, subject to God's effective grace. It is surely a bloodless, abstracted persona, identified by quality of disposition, able to produce a faith independently exercised. Now, perhaps I state that objection with undue confidence, and I grant we are here getting into a realm where dexterous conceptual maneuvers are available on all sides. The second interpretation is usually associated today with open theism, or at least some open theists. It runs like this. God elects a company or class of people, but not its individual members. The company is appropriately termed called and chosen, but God foreknows or predestines not the person, but the class. Individuals must freely opt in or not. As is the case with the Arminian resolution, if all else fails and we need a synthesis of biblical materials, these propositions should be explored further. But as with Arminian resolution, it seems to me subject to two weaknesses. Firstly, God's dealings with individuals, especially in matters of faith and salvation, are too personal, too particular, too intimate to permit this construction. The shepherd calls his own by name. I have other sheep, says Jesus, extending the application of his words beyond the first circle. I must bring them also. The Son of God loved me and gave himself for me, said Paul, speaking of a love characteristically bestowed upon the elect. I am not addressing here the question of the scope of God's love at this point, just noting ad hoc the implications of this kind of phrase. It chimes in with what Paul tells us, tells the Ephesians, when he speaks to them of God's choosing us. God does not predestine a temporal space into which an individual can come, or a company nameless on the occasion of predestination. He apparently predestines particular people so that they enter in time and the space provided for them. Second problem with open theism here is this. One reason that open theists interpret texts along these lines is apparently the perceived incompatibility between God's foreknowledge, in the English sense of that word, with human freedom. Now, with this point, the gate is flung wide into pasture lands, complex in the constitution of their soils, traversed, indeed, trampled for centuries, even millennia, by theological hunting parties, seen of protracted disputes over the theological environment that is home to variously configured ecosystems. Well, that's a long sentence, but I liked it. And I, it sounded impressive. It sounded impressive when I wrote it down, but not when I said it. <laughs> I shall not join this merry throng. I'm against hunting anyway. It goes without saying that all concepts concerned must be rightly honed, both with respect to the semantics of biblical language and in the service of precise philosophical adumbration. Freedom, foreknowledge, the relation of foreknowledge to foreordination, we have to hone all those very precisely. Theologically, our first port of call must be scripture. Argument over the biblical text is one thing. The declaration of conceptual incompatibility is another. To the extent that there is reliance on the latter, that is, the perception of incompatibility on philosophical grounds, to the extent there is any reliance on that, the proposition in question that divine foreknowledge is inconsistent with any religiously meaningful form of freedom is altogether precarious. Where contradiction is not formally demonstrable in theology, uh, sorry, where contradiction is, where contradiction is ever formally demonstrable in theology, we should indeed outlaw any offending proposition. It may be an evangelical courage, but it is an intellectual futility to say with Bart that the law of contradiction should be suspended if it clashes with the gospel. I picked that up from uh, Bernard Ram, who in his book After Fundamentalism reports Bart as having said that. So I'm simply there following 
Ram's account of the conversation. Until Zen Buddhism conquers the West, I, for one, am reluctant to consider ousting the law of non-contradiction. But in the area that concerns us, demonstrations are exceedingly difficult. Even a demonstration of high probability is daunting. The consistency of divine foreknowledge with libertarian freedom has been ably defended. The compatibility of divine predestination with liberty of spontaneity, freedom to follow what we want, has been ably defended too. I'm not commenting on these defenses, but we surely do not want to make any belief of practical importance in life hostage to the precarious technical intricacies of logical explication. Because in such demonstration, one logical slip causes everything to collapse. An argument is only as good as any logical link in it. One mistake, you're out. And it's interesting, isn't it? Uh, in these areas, if you make a logical error, error in a technical demonstration, and you're found to be wrong, what you do? Well, what you tend to do is to try another demonstration. Why? It shows that you are not basing your belief on the first demonstration anyway. If you're basing your belief on that, why would you go back a second time when it all collapsed to try again? Obviously, intuitions drive this much more than the conclusion of logical arguments. Now, my conclusions are provisional, uh, and if you wish, tentative at this juncture. It is impossible to conclude on the meaning of election or predestination merely by a quick reference to one or two texts I have done. We receive them in a canonical context where many other things are said and in a theological relationship with other things said. Things said elsewhere in the canon may persuade us to modify or change our interpretation of their meaning. Other things said in manifest theological proximity to the topic of election are directly relevant to the determination of the meaning of election. All I contend for, therefore, is the prima facie case for reading references to predestination just as far as they have been read along broadly Augustinian lines. But Augustinian covers differences. Lutheranism, Calvinism, and Jansenism are examples of positions that lay claim to the Augustinian heritage on predestination. At least as far as single predestination is concerned, which is as far as we have gone. Augustine himself eventually espoused the form of what has sometimes been called double predestination. And this reading of scripture is held either to compound difficulties already imminent in single predestination or to yoke an unacceptable supplementary teaching about a decree of reprobation to a teaching of predestination to life, which we should positively embrace. The decree of reprobation is formulated in alternative ways. Sometimes the language of passing over is used God passes over some and leaves them to their sins and their just consequences. Sometimes the emphasis lies on God's active decree of reprobation. In the literature, we encounter careful verbal and theological distinctions. God's acting, permitting, decreeing, causing are factored into various formulations. However the formulation goes, the inclusion of reprobation in an antecedent decree is usually defended on one or more of three main grounds. A, it is explicit in scripture. B, it is entailed by single predestination. C, it is implicit in the biblical teaching that God ordains all that come to pass. Now that last, of course, draws in the subject of providence, touched on in the first lecture and subsumes the particular decree of reprobation under it. All I can say here is that biblical statements about God's activity, which come under the heading of providence, presuppose the temporal stage. That stage occupied and crowded by evil and sinful action brought into the world by humankind. We may occasionally be led to peer beyond it into what we imagine as the time of God before time began, and more frequently privileged to train our eyes vertically into the heavenly present rather than horizontally into the past. But we cannot gaze into a pre-temporal, pre-providential order 
when it comes to this most solemn of all putative decrees. And when we observe the order itself, we typically see it, that is the providential order, adapted to a fallen world. It does not seem to me that actions, decisions, and ordinations effected and displayed in providential time can be schematically connected with antecedent immutable degree in respect of something as serious as eschatological perdition in an attempt to fill out a theological doctrine of providence. That's one ground, and I'm not, I'm not accepting that as a ground for reprobation. I don't think it follows from the doctrine of providence. Well, if it does not appear on the screen of providence, is an antecedent decree of reprobation explicitly taught in Scripture? Yet again, any detailed attempt to be definitive, we eschew. You must think I spend more time in these lectures saying what we're not talking about than when we are talking about. But please have pity on me. You know how complex these things are and how long it would take to go through them all. Now, of course, if you're suggesting I extend these lectures to a series of 24 or 52, then let's get going right now and let's exegete these carefully. I see Professor Van Hoos's face drop at the very prospect. He trembles and shakes. No, no, he says, enough, enough. So on I go. But the exegesis of Jude 4 alone is contentious, a text that often features in this discussion, where we read that the condemnation of certain men was palai pro gegramenoi, written about long ago, NIV, a phrase which even Richard Bockham thinks bristles with difficulties. But there is surely a hermeneutical rule which must be brought into play here. It is obviously not an exclusive method whereby to go about the determination of meaning. However, we underplay it at our peril. Blandly stated, we must accord narrative a significant hermeneutical place. A few moments ago, I slipped in the word stage with reference to the scene of human history. And there's been a lot of interest, recent interest in scripture as drama. And of course, Professor Van Hoos has done particularly distinguished work here. So I'm not using narrative in determined preference to drama or exploring the advisability of referring to dramatic narrative. I'm not concerned about those distinctions right here. To that extent, nothing sophisticated is in view. I just put in an ordinary plea for the story of Israel to have a heavy hand on a hermeneutical tiller here. Take two passages to which appeal is made in connection with reprobation. 1 Peter 2.8, and a significant portion of Romans 9. According to Peter, the stone which the Lord laid in Zion causes men to stumble. It is a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. Happy enough if people want to amend that translation a bit. For my purposes, I don't have to have it exact. That's NIV, actually. Peter's addressing a readership which appears to be mainly Gentile, but in any case is hailed in the corporate terms applied to Israel. Elect, sanctified, a chosen people, a royal priesthood. In contrast to those who believe, who treat as a capstone or cornerstone, the stone that the builders rejected, those who disbelieve stumble and fall. Peter's exposition is surrounded by reference to Isaiah. Precious cornerstone is found in Isaiah chapter 28. The stumbling stone is found in Isaiah chapter 8. The former verse cited from Isaiah is explicitly cited in the New Testament only here and in Romans 9. But Isaiah makes clear what is in any case clear in the Old Testament from the narrative. It is the hardened heart of disobedient Israelites that brings on the judgment of God. The judgment may take the form of a further hardening, and the further hardening may further God's purposes. God may know beforehand what humans will do and plan what he will do, but it is on account of, with reference to the willful disobedience, which is in its nature a self-hardening, that God acts in judgment. When Paul turns to the case of Pharaoh in Romans, he does not tell us that Pharaoh hardened his own heart, although that is said in Exodus. However, in Exodus, it is more often said there that God hardened it. But even if both Paul and the Exodus narrative would have us understand that God hardens Pharaoh, so that he hardens his own heart, even if that's the way we should have turned it, we are not thereby encouraged to believe that it was, to put it crudely, God who started it in the first place. 
we may not be warranted in saying with complete confidence that Paul visualized God's hardening of Pharaoh in line with the hardening of Israel. But the phenomenon of hardening, which applies to both Pharaoh and Israel, was grimly familiar to Paul from the whole history of his nation. It is surely likely that he thought along those lines, that he'd have seen the, Pharaoh, the hardening of Pharaoh along lines of the hardening of Israel in certain ways. Which means that he brought it on himself. The narrative succeeds, to us, succeeds sorry, in disclosing to us a character, Pharaoh, whose actions God directs along the very grain of that character. It is not as though we get the impression that Pharaoh was a pretty nice guy until God came along and hardened his heart. Or that God antecedently decided to make sure that there would be nothing nice about him. Do you get that impression from the narrative? I don't. That Paul wants to make a point about divine sovereignty and divine action is as clear in Romans 9 as it is in the whole prophecy of Isaiah. But the presupposition is that we are dealing with God's action towards people or towards a whole humanity responsible for its own wickedness. The pattern followed here, I think, is that in Romans 1, where it is sin itself that brings on God's handing over of people to sinful practices, that way around. It is not just the wickedness of generic human nature that appears in the Old Testament, but the wickedness of particular human individuals or their actions. This point is central whether or not Paul is talking about or including in his teaching the eschatological reprobation of Pharaoh about which people argue. But what about the case of Esau? Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. Now my own reading is that the question of personal reprobation is simply not involved in this case. If you read, for example, Psalm 78, it says about, talks about God rejecting Joseph, not choosing Ephraim, but choosing Judah instead. No reprobation there. There is a unity to God's electing call in the case of Jacob. There's a kind of seamlessness in election there, I agree. Jacob is elect to service and to a personal destiny, yes, for he will sit down at banquet with Father, Father Isaac and grandfather Abraham in the presence of the God who is the God not of the dead, but of the living. But it does not logically follow, and is not required by any code of biblical symmetry, that Esau, rejected for God's purpose in election, is also eschatologically reprobated in one and the same act. Even if we conclude that eschatological reprobation applies to Pharaoh, we must not assume an identity of cases between Esau and Pharaoh. Esau is not hardened in the course of history, and Pharaoh is not rejected within the family line of Abraham and Isaac. Pharaoh is an individual whose personal family tree is of no particular soteriological explicit significance in Scripture. Esau is an individual, but he also figures at the head of the Edomites, who are all rejected in Esau's rejection, and in which role the prophet Malachi surely envisions him. When Malachi announces God's behalf, yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. Of the eschatological fate of Esau, or individuals descended from him, we do not learn. If we make inferences about it, it will be on a wider basis than provided by Paul's teaching at this point. Both Esau and Pharaoh illustrate the sovereignty of God in election, but the course of election winds through varied terrain, taking into account different conditions and elements. We must not flatten out all of God's discriminating activities. I'm well aware of the limits of my discussion. I've not touched on John, for example, whom I should again interpret with reference to its narrative disclosure of human nature, the culpably guilty human heart. But surely it'll be urged at the very most what might be established by these remarks is the lack of an explicit statement of a divine reprobative pre-temporal decree. Still, is it not obviously entailed by single predestination? This was the third ground mentioned earlier and takes us on to terrain which I hope to cover in the next lecture in connection with the nature of systematic theology. For now, I merely draw attention to the contrast Luke sets before us in Acts 13.48. That's the reference to ordination to eternal life. It follows in Luke Paul and Barnabas' evangelistic effort vis-a-vis -vis the Jews. The Jews oppose them, so Paul responds, we had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. 
And he quotes, of course, Isaiah, before Luke tells us that the Gentiles rejoiced at the fulfillment of prophecy and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. In other words, the contrast here is not between those predestined to life and those predestined to death. In fact, even if we infer what seem of, seems obvious, that some were not pressed into life, the force or point of foreordination language is not the contrast between those pressed into life and those not pressed into life. The outstanding contrast in manifest harmony with the preceding and succeeding narrative, even when it does not pursue it in such explicit terms, the contrast is between a call that is genuine and responsibly rejected on the one hand and a predestination to life on the other. Many are called, but few are chosen, seems to sum it up. Objection. Does plain honesty not dictate that whatever we're making of biblical narrative and the import of Lucan speech acts, we accept the elementary logic of the situation, even if Luke and others do not aim to draw attention to a passing over which accompanies predestination when speaking of God's election, Surely, someone will say, such passing over manifestly does take place. And since God does not proceed inadvertently, this must amount to an active determination of destiny. Now, of course, independent questions about destiny arise here, including the destiny of those who have not heard, along with that of those who have heard the gospel. These are obviously important in their time and place, and indeed in connection with election. All I can do here is to assume that on any plausible interpretation of anyone's destiny, the inheritance of those whom God predestines to glory, expressed in a call effective in history, in history, is a peerless prize. Assuming this, it must be granted that the implication that God passes over is difficult to avoid as far as it goes. But the question is how far it does go. Theology must be eager to follow where scripture explicitly leads and wary where it does not. Eager to seize on what scripture teaches clearly. Cautious to handle where scripture is merely elusive at best. If a matter is not foregrounded, its logical dimensions will often be particularly elusive. It is certainly problematic theological procedure if we begin our thinking at a point different from that to which scripture draws our attention and fix confidently on the duality of God's predestination, foreordination. Predestination to life is biblically exhibited in its contrasting connection to a call that is culpably refused. We must not make problematic the reality of the culpably rejected opportunity for the sake of pretended knowledge of the logic of passing over. Rather, we should be ready to be quite unclear on the logic of passing over in light of the reality of rejected opportunity. I don't mean to underestimate the complexities that we encounter here. Early in the Bible, we encounter them. Moses set before the people the choice of life or death, but God told him that the people would forsake him. As far as the semantics and theology go at this point, God's knowledge of what the Israelites will do does not impinge upon their action. The content of God's foreknowledge is what they will freely do. And if what God foreknows will come to pass necessarily comes to pass, what necessarily comes to pass is a culpably responsible or free decision. At least that is how it looks if you pretend you've never read philosophy when you read Deuteronomy. A good pretense to keep up. But it's not quite thus with Joshua, admittedly. Joshua makes much the same appeal at the end of his days and his book as Moses does in his. But the wording is stronger. Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. But also, says Joshua, you are not able. The wording, the original is strong. You are not able to serve the Lord. Now, admittedly, Joshua does not stop there. But against this background, not to mention the mystery of God's execution of his counsel in history, we may not assume automatically that at the temporal point of summons in Acts 13 or other places, there was a simultaneous unhardened openness to receiving it on the part of all people. It's a whole group here after all. 
Nevertheless, the summons is a revelation of the realities which are obtained between God, humans, and message. If, at the temporal point of summons, we cannot always straightforwardly assume the existential possibility then and there of a positive response by everyone in the crowd, the whole scene nevertheless declares that God gave people the opportunity of a positive response which they did not take. That is, the whole scene reflects not the eternal decree, but the temporal failure, temporal realities, if rather unfathomable ones. We shall return to these matters in the next lecture. Given the history of theology, I've allowed myself to be detained by some of its characteristic concerns. But scripture's own witness on election trains our eyes largely in the direction of history in the New as well as the Old Testament. Paul keeps in his mind on Jews and Gentiles, looking forward through tears of sorrow to an eschatological resolution in the hands of God. The eschatological question of Israel scarcely deserves the neglect which it is receiving in these lectures, certainly if our inquiry is about election in the New Testament and not in the history of theology. If the Old Testament does take its leave of us, suggesting a primacy of Israel in the eschatological order, as we were saying on Thursday, that does not entail that it must remain so in the eschatological order of the new, in order for the later to remain true to the former testament. For the privileges of Israel belong to the church of Jews and Gentiles. This is not supersessionism. The church is the body of believing Gentiles grafted onto and now made part of the people of God with the believing Jews who acknowledge their Messiah. I take it that the question of the future of ethnic Israel, in whatever form we can delineate historical continuities over centuries and millennia, is patient of more than one interpretive resolution. This resolution presumably lies in the same place as the resolution of the comprehensive riddle of election, namely in the eschatological future. The resolution of the riddle of election is hidden somewhere within the folds of the book that closes the Christian canon. Perhaps we neglect according to the book of Revelation, which closes the canon of Christian scripture, the hermeneutical function due to it in the New Testament, biblical, and Christian theology. Its symbolic, sometimes coded character to the post-apostolic mind not to mention the divergent interpretations it has spawned, tend to rule revelation out a priori from being a promising candidate for ordering our theological reflection. But is this a misapplication of the sane rule that we must interpret the obscure by the clear? Are the transparent narrative history and clear doctrinal formulations that we find in much of scripture meant to be held fast within a scheme where the transparency of the history and the formulation of doctrine fade away at the protological and eschatological margins in Scripture, Genesis and Revelation. Transparency and formulation fade away, not history and doctrine fading away. And instead of speaking of fading at the margins, we might, in this bicentenary of Tennyson's birth, speak of fading margins and of Genesis and Revelation as an arch where through gleams that untraveled world whose margin fades forever and forever. Tennyson, Ulysses. Not to be confused with Tennyson's Odysseus. Odysseus was Ulysses, of course, but not in Tennyson's poetry, the two different poems. <coughs> Could it be that it is only when the book of Revelation is accorded hermeneutical centrality in our understanding of biblical theology and thus in the construction of Christian doctrine that we shall make progress on election? like all else. This would be a far-reaching conclusion within Protestantism, given what Luther and Zwingli, perhaps Calvin too, made of Revelation, and the association of a central hermeneutical role with Joachim of Fiore, whose work appeared in Venice uh, during the time of the Reformation under the theological sponsorship of the Anabaptists. Now, the interpretation of Revelation, and I'm drawing to a close here, the interpretation of Revelation is highly contentious, of course, if Romans 11 portends in sober, if stirring language, further reversal in the story of election, Revelation does so in the dramatic language of an imagery which strains but does not quite burst narrative form. After battles are done, the nations will walk by the light of the city of God 
and the kings of the earth bring their splendor into it. Nations apparently come to enjoy the privileges of covenant people. The glory and honor that they bring reflects the glory and honor bestowed upon and to the Lamb by the heavenly choir of the redeemed. Now, our enthusiasm mustn't go too far at this point. One commentator speaks of the nations balancing up and even compensating for the adoration previously offered to the monster in Revelation. And Solomon's book, Cordeus Homo, <coughs> unforgettably stamps upon our hearts the impression that we can never compensate for sin. But a positive destiny for the nations is manifest. But what is involved? Are the nations converted? Who is included in the nations? Do the rebellious kings return on stage like characters in the play, smiling, united, joining hands at the curtain call after the brutal hostilities of the drama? Universalism seems, seems excluded, but do at least some privileged dead from the nations enter the city of God by grace to join the elect? We may not be able to dig out any clear answer from Revelation itself. Revelation shares the persistent biblical habit of focusing our attention elsewhere where the relation of the nations to elections is concerned. That is, focusing our attention on history in front of us, not the fate of those who've gone before, uh, who died in the nations. The constant presence of Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Zechariah, which pervade the book, actually do not particularly encourage the thought of the individual dead being in with the nations. That is, the individual dead from the nations, outside the covenant people. Even though there's not a positive strike against it, I think. For the presence of these prophecies in the book of Revelation, Ezekiel, Daniel, Zechariah, Isaiah, keep alive in us an underlying sense of history in motion. Even while Revelation does not provide a unilinear depiction of history through its imagery. That is, as the story of election runs out in a massive hope for the joining of the elect by the nations, the immediate pictorial impression is not of nations whose dead are brought to life. It has a more kind of premillennialist flavor about it, where something akin to the historical future is still in view. Revelation depicts a story not yet ended, <clears throat> and as we close the book, the hopes of the Old Testament are reaffirmed in transformed mode. The reappearance of the ark, <clears throat> the inscription of the names of the 12 tribes of Israel on the gates accompanying those of the 12 apostles of the foundations. The very texture of the, authorized, or of the author's Greek, although I know the habit of viewing it as Hebraic, Jewish, Greek, I understand that habit has, has gone somewhat. Anyway, all this doubtless encourages many to think positively about the future prospects for ethnic Jews. But it was only the course of history as interpreted in the New Testament which disclosed to us the true meaning of the hope to which the Old Testament beckons. Surely only the eschaton will disclose the hope to which the New Testament beckons us. Perhaps Revelation provides us with the last earthly word on the riddle of election. And its last word is the same as we find in the Old Testament, that we shall not know how the story ends till we get there. One more long paragraph, and that's it. <clears throat> we too can end more or less where the last lecture ended. But we also know for sure, as with the last lecture on the question of reigning, remember that? That followers of the Lamb are destined to reign with him. Reign is a subject broached right from the beginning of Revelation in chapters 1 to 3. Our egalitarian instincts may shy away from the thought of any gradation and reward, but the presence of the martyrs in the book of Revelation, quite apart from other hints in the New Testament, warn us not to transpose into apocalyptic key the assumptions of democratic politics. <clears throat> if we have surrendered to God the right to make distinctions in election, we must surrender to him here too, if we are called to do so. Jonathan Edwards speaks edifying words. Not the least remainder of any principle of envy, he says, will be exercised towards any angels or saints who are superior in glory. No contempt or slight towards any who are inferior. Those who have a lower station of glory than others suffer no diminution of their own happiness by seeing others above them in glory. All rest and remain in the happiness of each. <clears throat> 
one more quotation from Edwards, who was fascinated by the apocalypse. Uh, the expert on that, Doug Sweeney, is here. One more quotation. Those that are highest in glory are those that are highest in holiness, and therefore are those that are most beloved by all the saints, for the saints must love those that are most holy, and so they will rejoice in their being the most happy. As regards election, it is only the eschatological manifestation of God's ways that will draw together for us the threads of biblical teaching. In one respect, the mystery is deepened after the old, for at least there we could sufficiently identify the elect and the nations. The denationalization and depoliticization of the elect in the New Testament, I use those phrases very roughly because I'm not altogether happy with it, but uh, to the extent that happens, makes the identification of nations harder at the end of the apocalypse, sorry, as far as I can tell. Yet the relation obtaining between the covenant and elect people of God, now Jew and Gentile, and the nations, which will presumably come in at the end, resembles what we read about in the Old Testament up to a point. For while we learn in Revelation that the nations will participate in the kingdom, we are not told that they will reign. The letter to Thyatira, he who overcomes will be given authority over the nations. We may be sure of this. How election stands in relation to nation, universe, non-elect. How it stands in relation to God's love, mercy, and justice will only confirm what John has told us. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. It is a light by which the nations will walk and whose dawning we must be content to await. Berkawa where there is an eschatological perspective, arbitrariness is ruled out. Thank you. We will uh, take up some of these themes, all being well, in the afternoon session. So I hope as many of you as can make it will make it. <laughs>